today we are outside on a beautiful first day of spring uh, to show off the two newest additions to the State House here, which are new flagpoles. Uh, folks may or may not have noticed it, but for the last few months we've actually been down to one flagpole here. And um, we've just in the last couple of weeks been able to put these new poles back up. Um, beautiful, up to date. The old poles were in, uh, moving towards being in disrepair. We had a, a major um, steam pipe work that was done here on the State House lawn, and when they had to remove the flagpole here on the east side, uh, at the time they realized it was in pretty good disrepair so completely replaced flagpoles um, they have the balls on top are gilded so similar to the gilding on the dome we have gilded balls atop the flagpoles uh, these new poles also have uh, illumination so that the flags can be illuminated at night and do not need to go up and down every day um, the flagpoles here is an, inter are an interesting story. Originally when the State House uh, went up, there was one flagpole and it actually stood at the apex, at the peak of the portico, on the roof of the portico, on the front of the building. And uh, each day in the morning, someone would actually open the window and walk out onto the roof of the portico, raise the flag, and each night they would go back out and bring it down and bring it in. Uh, one of the ways we know this is there are uh, older photographs that actually show that center window open in the State House. And, uh, at, at some point in time there was a question about why that was before we realized that's what it was. There's also, um, because it was happening every day, there's also a track that's sort of worn into the roof of the portico where this person or these people, whoever was in charge of the flag, uh, made their trip out each day uh, to, to raise that flag. Uh, so it was pretty interesting uh, to discover that. And we're not sure the exact date, but at some point, probably not that long after World War II, is when the flagpoles went up in their current location and have been replaced a couple times over the years, but uh, the ones that were here previously were certainly overdue for a replacement. And uh, what we found, again, was we survived with one flagpole on the on the east side of the building uh, for a period of time, but ultimately now we don't have to overload it with flags. Uh, the flag here on the uh, west of the building always has the American flag and the POW flag. The Vermont flag uh, flies proudly on the east side, and uh, the new poles as well have with the new um, gears and machinery there make it much easier for our staff here to put flags up and take fl flags down when needed. It's going to make it much easier and they'll be more sturdy on days where we have two or three flags flying on a particular pole. So something that folks may not realize is new when they drive by or may not pay a lot of attention to, um, but we're certainly very happy to have these back and happy that they planned ahead and actually poured the concrete slabs for these before it got cold and, and uh, below zero and we weren't able to do anything that way. So uh, a couple weeks ago they were just able to come up and over a couple hours with the, with the crane pop these these back up and uh, certainly something that had been lacking that, that symmetry in front of the building uh, and the nice look of having two flagpoles where we can fly all the appropriate flags here uh, in the state of Vermont. So when you drive by take a peek and, and admire the fact that we are back to two flagpoles here. Good morning. I'm Representative Molly Burke from Brattleboro and I'm here in the legislature and I am meeting with Dr. Soriano from Chile and it's very interesting to talk with him. He has talking about the Icelandic model of after-school care and I happen to have a, an after-school program so I'm really interested to hear more about this Icelandic model and I've also spent time in Chile so we've had a lot to talk about but now we want to hear about this after-school program and the progress that Chile has made. Thank you, Molly. It's a real pleasure to be here in the capital, speaking with the governor, speaking with your Congress people, uh, and sharing a little bit of the information of what we have lived through, because although we are not the opium capital of the world, we hold the record for children with the highest consumption of alcohol and drugs and marijuana. So how, what do we do to protect our children representatives? Uh, and uh, the answer is, Here's a prescription. Here's a prescription. A country that has succeeded in being the one that consumes the most drugs and alcohol in children to the one that consumes the least. If they have the records in Europe and now they have children who are so healthy that they get a soccer team that beats England. You know, mighty England uh, is, was beat by a tiny island uh, of, of Iceland. Now, some people say, well, you know, what do people in Vermont have to do with um, 
Iceland? And uh, the answer is everything, because we're all human beings, and, and you treat a tonsillitis uh, equally in uh, Kalamazoo as you do in Timbuktu, as you do in Santiago, Chile. And so they have a, a good tool to, to diagnose and give a prescription for townships. What does that township, how do we better allocate resources? Maybe this township needs more interaction amongst parents. And that's all it needs. And that's going to bring the numbers down. Maybe another township needs, you know, some sports facility, more after school. So why, why also did they succeed? Well, they succeeded because everybody in Iceland thought we're going to protect our children. They succeeded not because they were blonde or Iceland or, or Nordic, because other Nordic countries are not doing as well. They succeeded not because they're a small island, because Malta, another European community um, uh, 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 country, is not doing as well. They succeeded because they had this scientific tool and this, this union between the people in the townships, grassroots, the legislators, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who, 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 who draw the path of, 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 your, uh, of your state, and the, and the researchers. So everybody got together to protect the children with a method that works. I'd like to ask a question. How is this funded in Iceland, and how are you doing that in Chile? Because funding is the big issue around this building. Fund, funding is the big issue, and if we can do it in Chile, certainly you can do it in Vermont. It's the service that the Icelandic people uh, do is costs little. They give you a diagnosis and a prescription. So how bad your problem is, what do you have to do to fix it? Uh, the, 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 where do you buy the prescriptions? You know, the drugs are the most important, uh, most expensive ticket in the, in the health bill. They're also the most expensive ticket in the, in the prevention bill. But, you know, it was Benjamin Franklin who said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And in, in, it's much, much cheaper to, to prevent an addict becoming an addict than to treat an addict. Uh, so the answer is you can't afford not to prevent. You can't afford not to vaccinate is what we found, we pediatricians found this last century. Well, it's about time we find the same thing about drugs with children. And some things don't cost anything, like, like facilitating parental networks that will, that will balance the peer group networks and, 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 and giving a consistent message. Drugs are bad for children. <laughs> Alcohol is bad for children. You don't regulate. You don't teach children how to consume opioids. You tell them, please, Wait at least until you're 18 or 25, when your frontal lobe has better impulse control. If a 13-year-old if a child drinks alcohol, there's a 65% chance he'll become drunk. Uh, I, know, I know Rick McMahon, uh, our, our journalist here, does not get drunk every time he takes a beer in one of your wonderful breweries. But a child will. A child will, so let's protect children. Let's do it in Vermont because you can do it. Wonderful message. And I think uh, we need to think about this as a state because we do have an opioid crisis here and a lot of, a lot of poverty and a lot of, a lot of issues that I think could be addressed. So I'd be interested to hear more about the Icelandic model and to hear what you're doing in Chile. Well, we'll be happy to keep you posted, but let's, let's work in this world for healthier children because we can have children free from alcohol and drugs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, yeah. Representative. Yeah, very nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. Good afternoon. My name is Representative Bob Helm. I um, am state State Vermont State Representative from Fairhaven. I represent Fairhaven, Castleton, West Haven, and Hubbardton. Best part of Western Rutland County. Um, anyways, spring is coming and we're looking forward to it, although it's not coming quite as quick as I wish it was. But on the legislature, I, I sit in the Appropriations Committee and um, you know, I work on every detail within the budget. However, each individual picks, doesn't always pick, sometimes gets assigned their own interests. And I spend a lot of time working for um, issues with Vermont State Colleges, their funding issues. Um, 
this year we're trying to squeak out three million to add to their base budget. I hope in the next few days I should know, but I hope we'll be successful at that. Another smaller dollar issue, but very important to a lot of people issue is the state fish hatcheries. The, um, we, we, we've put together a plan for that to keep them open for at least four years and also it has some language there that gets the Fish and Wildlife Department to work with the Agency of Natural Resources to try to come up with some of their water issues that they supposedly had out there. Um, hopefully we can get, in, within a four year time frame, we can get that um, set up so they can keep the hatchery open. I'll tell you, it'll be a big disappointment if we can't for fishing and for the economy. Um, a lot of fishermen come into the state for the reason to fish. Um, my, one of my bigger parts in the budget is transportation, the agency of and there are a number of moving parts in, in that bill. There's like 24 or 5 sections. Um, one that may be of interest to the average person is the uh, town highway funding, which we have tweaked up a little bit, not down, up. Every so often they get a little extra money over there and um, they actually did that in the transportation committee and that will be going out tomorrow and the next day on the, onto the floor or through the system onto the floor next week um, for approval I hope and then on to the Senate. We will, we've got basically one week left in uh, March, the month of April and we're supposed to be out of here the very first part of May so everybody starts to hustle about this time of year. It really gets it really gets busy. Um, so, you know, that's that's about all I'll mention for now. Um, but if anybody's got an issue, they want to call me or email me, I'm at email rock and marble inc. R O C K A N D M A R B L E I N C at gmail.com or 802-770-0262. That's my cell. I'll, I can answer it if I'm not in a committee meeting right here at the State House. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Greetings. This is State Representative Mike Merwicki from the Southeast Kingdom of Vermont. I'm in the Wyndham 4 del uh, District of Putney, Dummerston, and Westminster. That's in Wyndham County. And we border New Hampshire and Massachusetts in our county. So we're down in the bottom right hand corner of Vermont. Um, <clears throat> I work on the Government Operations Committee, but this is the time of year where lots of bills are moving around. It's, uh, we just passed what's called crossover for policy bills. So bills had to get out of the Committee of Jurisdiction and be considered by the full House so they could get over to the Senate and then hopefully get in the queue for eventual passage by both bodies and then signature by the governor to become law. Uh, we've been working on a lot of different things and the next thing that we're working on right now, the big bills are the, the money bills. This is the budget and the tax bill from, from Ways and Means, how we raise the revenues to support the, the work of the state. Um, <clears throat> alongside that, one of the things I'd like to just say a few words about today is the the reality of how we're recognizing what an important concern taking climate action is. <clears throat> climate action is uh, something that we are trying to raise the profile of because we, we're seeing the weather that's happening in this state, in this country, and around the world. And, and weather is not climate, but weather is an indicator of climate. Climate is the, the big picture weather is the day-to-day -day picture. And one day or another doesn't necessarily indicate climate change, but what we're seeing is that the, the world is warming and, and that's manifesting in, in more radical weather here around the country. And our take on it, or many of us believe that humans have a factor in, in making the situation that we have right now and uh, many people, and especially in the last week or so, many students around the country and around the world 
are asking for climate action. So as a legislator, one of the things we're trying to bring more people into the fold around is the need for us to take those actions which can uh, create a sustainable community, uh, uh, sustainable state and communities. Um, the reality is, and the good side of this is, many of these things are also go hand in hand with economic development. Uh, if we want to create a new green economy, we have alternative energy, conservation, weatherization, which are all economic opportunities to grow the economy and to help make our, our state uh, a better place. We have other opportunities uh, in um, agriculture, forestry. What we know is that our trees, our soil, are, are great sponges, if you will, for, for holding carbon, for pulling it out of the air. And these are other opportunities that we have to, to grow those sectors of our economy very important sectors have all, always been and, and make them even more beneficial because of their, their environmental impact. We know that regenerative soil programs uh, help soil be more productive and also be able to hold more carbon. Forest management practices can make our, our woodlands and forests more sustainable and better able to sequester carbon uh, w within the cycle. So. Many of us here are working hard. Uh, we have other ideas that to get more electric cars on the road, to more weatherization of homes, and alongside that, uh, from the day to day to the big picture, uh, we want to let people know this is a concern that w that we share with with people outside the state house and around the world, and that that we're working hard on this. So appreciate the opportunity, Rick, to share a little bit with constituents and again this is representative Mike Merwicki from Putney. Good afternoon my name is Rob LeClaire I am the junior representative from Barry Town I sit on the government operations committee I'm actually the ranking member one in I guess title but also seniority which is kind of unusual and I'm also the assistant minority leader to the House of Representatives Government operations, as you may or may not know, is a committee that has a lot of oversight over government operations. Um, this morning we took a couple hours of testimony regarding uh, tax and regulative cannabis. It's uh, a topic of discussion that's been here for several years, and it is very clear that something is going to happen this year. There does seem to be the all the the willpower to to put something out and honestly I have to say that based on what we have we we need to make the next step to work on something that has got some oversight and we can rest assured that the quality of the the, the marijuana that's out there um, is is safe because currently what we have there probably is there just isn't that assurance we're also taking a look at um, several different other issues. We spent a lot of time working with the Office of Professional Regulation that has oversight over most, well, up to 50 professions in the state from acupuncturists to architects. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about optometrists and ophthalmologists and as far as expanding the scope of practice for them. I um, personally would be very grateful for any feedback I could get from anybody in the state, but Barrytown residents in particular, for sure, on if you're following any issues here at the state house, um, where you, uh, how you feel about those. I take my title as representative very, very seriously, and I'm here to represent those who sent me, and quite honestly, the whole state. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Patrick Seymour, representing Sutton, Burke, and Linden up in the Northeast Kingdom, and We've been having an awfully good time here in Montpelier. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, the youngest member of the legislature this year, and it's been very interesting being able to give my perspective and my viewpoints to the people in my committee. I serve on the Judiciary Committee, and we've had some very interesting bills of sorts, but uh, I think that my testimony is valuable, and I think being a, a young person is, frankly, uh, it's a little bit different around here. Uh, there are five of us that are twenty, or six of us that are twenty-five or under, and uh, I think we—I mean, we don't all agree for certain. We're not all on the same page, but we—we th we seem to think that we're getting some stuff done. 
and uh, I'm having a good time so far. I don't know what else to say, really. <laughs> well, what, what bills are you working on committee? Ah, uh, yeah. So it's after crossover now, and we're uh, we're getting some bills from the Senate. We've only gotten three so far, so I'm I don't know. Uh, we'll continue to work on some of the other ones that we've had. Uh, I can't name any specifics off the. I know we are working on a consumer protection bill at the moment and debating the legality of it and. Uh, whether it's something that ought to be enforced or whether it's something that is going to harm business in the state. I know it's a concern for us because this is a state that business is struggling and people are struggling. We want to encourage people to move here, so we certainly don't want to make it harder. Um, some of the other bills, we, we've been doing things on expungement, which is a completely new thing for me because I did not come from a legal uh, background at all, coming from a small farming community up in the northeast and uh it's it's been a bit of a learning curve and so far i think it's i think expungement is there's there's certainly benefits to it i think it's beneficial for the economy though it does have uh, some some expense and uh there are all kinds of things we got to consider when we're putting into place these sorts of bills but judiciary prides itself on trying to be as nonpartisan as possible though we do have our uh, disputes at time and uh, that is that is something that I, I don't think in any other state in this uh, country you're gonna have as much agreement as you generally find here in Montpelier I mean there are still things that need to be debated uh, especially when it comes to some of the more fiscal notes but other than that we're pretty much in agreement on where we want to be just not necessarily where we want to get how we want to get there so that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rich Westman. I'm the senator from Lamoille. Um, my morning committee is health and welfare. Um, one of the more interesting issues we've been working on is trying to come up with a definition for universal primary care, uh, what would be included and what isn't. Um, that's a lot more difficult issue than most people would think. Only two states have struggled with that. Um, there are a number of think tank organizations, uh, the Millbank Memorial Fund that has worked on that. But to come up with exactly what you would have to fund if you did universal primary care, we're trying to come up with a definition for that and set out a process to do that. Um, the other issue our morning committee um, ha is struggling with is Proposition 5 to the Constitution, um, which would be um, an amendment to protect reproductive rights. Um, the interesting thing about that is a constitutional amendment not only has to be voted on on two separate elected legislatures, but it is a vote of the people. and. Um, for an issue that is as controversial as reproductive rights, a lot of us feel that um, a vote of the people is appropriate. My afternoon committee is appropriations. Um, we're still struggling somewhat with the House over the issue of the budget adjustment, which is the, a midterm adjustment to spending. And it seems the big drawback to that is the issue of lead and lead in schools and lead in um, um, child care facilities. The Senate has put the money in um, to do the testing. There were 16 schools last fall that they tested. All 16 schools had lead in some um, faucets and at least in three separate faucets that kids would either drink water out of or get cooking water out of. So the Senate has decided that um, um, the, there's a line in the sand and we aren't going to leave without a budget adjustment that includes money for the testing and to start the remediation of what we find. And the House has pulled the money out. So we're still arguing over that at this point. Um, those are kind of the big things in my world right now, and um, I thank you. Hi, I'm Senator Alice Nitka from Ludlow, and I represent all of Windsor County as well as the towns of Londonderry in Wyndham County and Mount Holly in Rutland County. Uh, this week, 
this last week was an extremely busy week as it was crossover, the date when the bills have to go from one from the House to the Senate and vice versa in order to be handled this year. Um, another thing that's been going on that isn't in the news so much is judicial retention. Uh, I'm on a committee that eight of us, four persons from the House, four from the Senate, who evaluate judges um, who come up for retention. In other words, these are judges who are wanting to serve another six years or if they filled out a term of another judge who was um, moved up to a different court or resigned or retired, um, then a judge might come up for retention prior to the six-year uh, event because they're fulfilling the term of another judge. So this year um, we have um, eight we have eight judges and one magistrate coming up for retention and this is a process that's been going on since last summer when surveys were sent out on these persons to attorneys that appeared in court before them to court staff to guardian ad litems and other persons working in the court system to give their opinion anonymously of the work of these judges um, this is a constitutional matter that is in our constitution from way back and it is it mandates the six-year period there's no review in between which has uh, come to make some difficulties in terms of judges who haven't been haven't had anybody look at their work or how they're how they're handling their courtroom or whatever and they suddenly come to retention and they find out that some people are dissatisfied with their work there may be um, their demeanor is uh, something that people are unhappy with it may be that they're not timely in their decisions and and how they manage the operation of the court when they're there presiding so many things um, come into play there are of course court personnel who are really ma and managers who are managing the court but the judge has to keep his own work going but being a judge in Vermont is not an easy job for these judges who are superior court judges and also the ju justices of the Vermont Supreme Court also come under this process some people are surprised at that but this is the way it works in Vermont and really I appreciate how it works in Vermont in that our judges don't have to be out there earning money for campaigns or campaigning door to door or standing on the corner like the rest of us waving etc because um, if, if it is that way as it is in some states um, raising money people might say they're they're biased on a case because of some money they receive they say the same things about us um, they might uh, be hesitant to make a decision that they know is the right one because publicly it won't be a popular decision I've seen this happen in some other states and so anyway this is the process we use it, they have to provide information about their finances their health they have to provide decisions that they've chosen that they want us to read and evaluate as to you know how they write and how they do on their decisions and as well as these anonymous questionnaires now you say anonymous questionnaires may well be that attorney for a party who didn't get his clients a success in front of that judge might send in something that says hey this guy's a jerk or or whatever but so we're looking at all of that and you know taking into account that someone may have been dissatisfied with a decision there are also are many cases where uh, a lawyer appearing before a judge will say that his client said to him well I didn't get the decision I wanted and thought I should get but I had a fair shake at it the other thing is um, the only judges in Vermont who are not going through this process are assistant judges who uh, used to be called side judges and appear in court with a judge and they handle things uh, frequently they're they're involved in like family cases um, and also the probate judges probate judges are elected for four years as are those assistant judges and they go through the regular process like a regular politician although our terms are for two years and their terms are for four similar to the state's attorneys so this year um, there are there are complaints about of the nine people who are being reviewed there are, I mean there are always some dissatisfaction of course and we're addressing that with three of the judges who are before us who quite frankly some of them were extremely surprised at what their areas of deficiency 
were seen as. And so we've, you know, we've been doing this for a number of years. There's, it's been going on forever, basically. But um, so the idea is to have them, they're able to address these issues in, in a public forum before our committee. We then hold a public hearing, um, which the public is invited to come to and speak out about these judges. You might have someone comes in who's, who had a bad decision in court. You might have someone come in who had a, a decision in court that they were very happy with. Or you might have someone come in, as I say, with uh, saying something like, I, you know, they were fair and honest, and I, and I, got a, I was able to be heard, and that's what I expected from the court system. Uh, the, uh, then, um, so if we hear some information that we think should be looked at further, um, in one of these cases we obtained the audio from the court hearing in which there was a complaint about the judge during that court hearing. Many of the courts have videos, so in some cases in years past, we've gotten a video and the audio, of course, uh, from that court. This year, this court only had audio. It didn't have video in their court. So anyway, we heard, listened to that audio, and from what we heard on the audio, it, it, it gave us the direct view of what the person had criticized. So the other thing was we also, um, uh, let's see, I was thinking, um, well, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. Never mind that. Um, anyway, so that's going on right now, and we're the final judge on the judges will be held um, next Wednesday. That's uh, March 27th, and it's held before the full assembly. In other words, the House and Senate do a combined assembly, and we all vote by secret ballot. And you know, why not? Every, you're, when you go into the voting booth, you vote by secret ballot. So anyway, that's coming up, and it's been an interesting process. Of course, our building sometimes is ablaze with rumors, so we're wanting to make sure everything is up and up, everything, everybody knows all the facts. Another thing is, some of the judges whom we have been critical of their performance, perhaps in some areas, it doesn't seem to ever be in all areas, it's just some areas, the judge and the chief superior court judge have written, you know, su suggested an agreement whereby they would be perhaps mentored by another judge, take a particular uh, course of study, uh, judicial, judicial college is something, they, those are, there are bench bar meetings, there are ways to have a judge um, review what they have been doing and see their areas of deficiency and improve. I think the hard, when I look at this, I say, if you were in a regular job, you might have an annual review or you might have at least a, every other year, somebody takes a look at your performance. Yeah. But with the case with judges and how our constitution sets it up, it's only every six years. So in those years, you might have, a, you have a chance to, uh, you know, feel that you're doing things right and suddenly you find out that something about the way you're doing or your sensitivity to a certain topic um, isn't what it should be. And these days, of course, there's, there has been for many years a, a question on the questionnaire about um, bias against women attorneys or bias against men attorneys or, you know, biases. That's always a question on there. It has been for a while, even though that's uh, very much in the news these days. It's, this is a question that's been asked for many years now. So anyway, uh, we'll be doing that voting, um, and it's a, it's a simple majority vote of those present and voting in order for the person to be retained. So it's a little piece that you don't hear about every day, although I think this year there's been a little bit of news about the retention process. So thanks a lot. See you again. Mm -hmm.